Call a special joint council and planning commission meeting to order. New business, discuss concerns about specific items of the proposed zoning regulations. Madam Mayor? Yes. The only thing that was presented to us to get out to anybody is the sheet that I have in front of you. Um, just to discuss the, the number of garage sales that could be held each year. Whether we can discuss that and see if we could increase it some. Madam Chair, yes. what was the purpose of trying to, uh, trying to set the limits on yard sales? Uh, is there a problem or has there been uh, complaints or? Uh, too many garage sales? No, not too many, but ones that go on forever. Right. Right, and they, end. and they never end, and they never pick up their stuff and remove right. it from, they just leave it sitting out there constantly in the weather and stuff. So, I think that's the problem, that I don't know what, who brought up the garage sale thing. Which, I did. Which council member? Oh, you I did. Mark? I'm the one that brought this up to uh, John's attention on this. Um, after speaking with uh, John, she explained to me uh, um, what the, exactly what you just said right now. So I, I can understand why we would have that to have something to fall back on and tell somebody you're leaving your stuff out here and it's like you just said and what John told me it's left out in the rain you know I mean that's it's kind of not something you need to do so I mean it needs to be picked up um, I would just like to see maybe just the two the number two increased a little bit because honestly not everybody has enough to sell six or seven garage sales worth, you know, maybe yeah. up to. That was what I was thinking, maybe limit the, the time that it that could be out for one sale, but not limit the number of sales necessary. And this actually says for three days, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I would like to see us stick with the limited number of sales. Limited number per year. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't have a problem Actually, with that. I, I would just like to see it maybe just increased a little bit. The, I uh, looked the up. City Halton. And the state of Kansas considers anything yes, more than two per year, one day right. each. You are a retail business and you are subject to sales tax. That was the other thing I had wondered about. After how long is it actually a small business and, and not just They're very strange. Tem temporary I don't sale. To monitor it, but that, that is the sales tax rule. Two per year and one day each. But I don't see a reason why we couldn't go to four. At least. I think four, because it's changing every season. season yeah. Right, I agree. I think if we did the four. Um, that would be fine with me. I mean, I would more than happily support that right there. I do yeah. think maybe limiting the days that it's out because... Oh, absolutely. The 10 day, 12 day, that's way too long to have. One day, two days two, is is two a is an okay sale, but when you start to go over that, it becomes a nuisance to yeah. the neighbors. So. About two and a half days, it takes you about a half day to get set up and have maybe two and a half days of sailing. Correct. Yes, Bickley. We're actually running into people who are doing consignment sales in the garage sales for groups or neighbors or something. A little, little bit of that will go on anyway, but it shouldn't be in such a grand scale. And it means they're competing with regular businesses that are paying for offices and stores and employees. Right. Okay, so we'll go to four sales. We'll go to four sales per year and days of selling. I think that's two and a half. Two and a half. Three. 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 Right now it says three. Yeah. Yes, right now it says three. Three per sale. No, three, yeah, three days, yeah. Do we, do we want to keep it at three days or do we just want to go with the two and a half? 
I would say two or two and a half. Yeah. Uh, this one now is not limiting the number per year, just the days that fill it's around. Yeah, it's limiting the same, the cells to fill us. Okay. Read on down. That's what I want. And no more than two cells per to be held at the same residence during any calendar year. And we were going to leave that at two or three? Four. 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 We could do the, the seasons, like you said. Yeah. Will they have their stuff out all through the time then? Or? No, no, no. They have to, it's yeah. only two days. If we go with the two day, they yeah. have they have the two days. I mean, then that includes the setting day. up and everything. And then pick it up and. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So two days or two and a half days? I'd say two and a half. It takes about half a day to get set up. Okay. So two and a half. Here that up there. You see where we're at, Bobby? No. We're on no. Six, um, six five. It's on the sheet that I have with your agenda. This was the only thing that was sent to John about the garage sale thing. Other than that, we have no idea what else we're discussing tonight. So there's nothing else got into John. So if if you want to bring something else up, no one knows what you're talking about. So I've got this deal I made this morning at six thirty and I had to be on location today and I couldn't get it to John. Okay. So we're okay with the two day sales and tuning or Four four sales per year and two and a half per sale. Okay. We have that, John. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Do you need a motion? No. No, we can do a consensus when we're all done. Okay. So, Bobby, Kevin, Amy, Mark, what else is on the? Do you want to discuss? Okay. Thank you. I need to hold on. accepting zoning districts were permitted. Okay, your, your greenhouse out here, the hydro, the tomato plant, they sell some tomatoes there at that plant. The next one says retail sales as an accessory use, unless the same or otherwise permitted to these regulations. I'd like some clarification on that. Go ahead, Victor. <coughs> First of all, we're talking about some land simply that would be in the city that people could have gardens on, and if it's big enough, they may grow some reasonable crops and so forth. They can't grow any, have any animals or things like that, unless your animal ordinance would allow it. Then it pins down the maintenance and operation of commercial greenhouses. In other words, these are not considered farming, they're more considered business, agribusiness type of thing. So they would come under your uh, industrial district. So they're allowed in your city, it's just they're not allowed in the lot next to you as an agricultural use. In other words, it's, a, it's an agricultural business is what it is. Okay, is that particular area, is it zoned industrial then? Let's, let's look that yep. up. I want. Right. It show. is. It is. They just you checked it out. Yep. Okay. Okay. Can you answer your question? And again, if anybody else wanted to do it, they could file for industrial and, and do it. It's just not a normal thing for gardens and, and minor agricultural activity. <clears throat> Did he answer your question? Uh, well, I just want to make sure that this is not going to interfere with the, the four star hydroponics out there where they're selling the tomatoes at that location right. where they're raising them. And now I understand they're into herbs and some other types. And it's the same, it would follow under the same thing, Bobby. Mm -hmm. 
uh, under uh, three one under the exemptions, why would the municipalities be exempt from these rules? We're putting these on the citizens. Uh, why why would the cities and the municipalities, the counties, not comply with the same rules? Are you talking about number one? We're talking about yes, I am. Well, my reason is these regulations do not control your right of way. The right of way is for public purpose, and you, on the city, control what what happens on those rights of way. And uh, first of all, most of these are on the right of way now. The other thing, though, is are, uh, it is possible that you might have a minor uh, telephone or pumping station. I had one the other day, somebody called me on, it's a 10 by 10 pumping station. And so those simply are exempt. Uh, you don't have to. You can work the case on the market if you want to. But this simply recognizes it in the field. Like a telephone, a telephone place, something like that. Uh, let's say you have an underground city uh, pumping station. You're not even going to see it. You might see the top of it. So it simply allows you. Now, it does if the city uh, built another city building or built another fire station or any of those. That comes under there. But just these utility things uh, are generally, I've never known a building ordinance that that regulated them because the governing body regulates them. Okay, well, I was thinking about the order you of you have it. Yeah, this is going. referring to existing in use yeah. poles and wires. Right. So, yeah. And you were referring to what? The, the yard the city's got south of town down here. That's They've got outside storage down there, telephone poles, and all kinds of stuff. Why is it right for them to be able to do that and citizens can't do that? It's in the industrial district, I believe. It allows for outside storage. Now, are you talking about? We talked about, about the defense around that. Yeah, I know we do. Yeah, and I do. I believe do believe it was declined because it was too expensive to put it up. Exactly. All right. Thank you. Yeah. But on the other hand, what about them, uh, citizen? Be expensive for him to put a fence up. What's the difference between I one for a citizen and I one for the city? Well, is, this, is that not allowed for anybody that's in I one? Bigly, what they're talking about here? Tell me what I, I'm, I'm not hearing too well. A screening, a screening for I-1 has to do with uh, the municipality and the private sector. The only thing I can see is different is there's only one house there in view of the deal, and in the other place there may be a whole city block of residential. And you have to have screening from one to the other. Is that what you're getting at? In here, the choice you have now, first of all, what you have there is going to be grandfathered in. So nobody there is going to be required to do any more than what they've had to do before. But if somebody comes in and wants a new commercial location, and say there are houses in back of it, you have a choice. But do you feel it's not desirable to, to require screening? Uh, for example, let's say that there's an alley in back and the person had six foot fences up. I don't think I'd require it. Uh, maybe in back it might be a church instead of in the residential area. So this gives you a choice whether you feel it's necessary to screen the back. At the same time, and it may not seem apparent when you do it, but I can tell you that many things are allowed to happen under zoning because they're screened. So you've got both here, and you have the discretion to do it or not do it. Okay. 
And you were talking about the city, kind of a shop area or something? Is that no, we store our telephone poles and stuff down here by the power plant, Bigley. Yeah. So, if it's I-1. They're not exempted by this statement. <coughs> they're, they're, they're part of the zoning. This would be a shop area for the city. And uh, I don't know how it's zoned and so forth, but I mean, it's, uh, it's the city, to answer your question, the city comes under these regulations, just like anybody else except for things that would be in the right-of-way, like poles and the street and, and things like that. But anything the city builds is a, a building, uh, they have to come that far, whatever it might be, uh, they would come under the uh, zoning regulations. That's traditional. Yeah. <coughs> And the answer to everybody could make that final decision anyway. You said, no, but we'll have a public hearing and at least people have an input to it. So, even though you still have the opportunity to make the final decision on things like that. The zoning commission or the, the council? Pardon me? The zoning commission or the council? Okay. The governing body, uh, the planning commission, You'll find in books and so forth, it'll say it's a recommending body. And the planning commission is. Everything that they do under zoning is a recommendation to the governing body. And the governing body makes the final determination. But anything that's under the board, when they change hats and become the board of zoning appeal, under the state law since 1939. And you have to have a Board of Zoning Appeal or you can't have zoning. Because there are bound to be some hardship things, particularly older areas, side yards, things like that. And so these people put on a new set of hats to become the Board of Zoning Appeal for three things. If somebody goes to the zoning administrator and, and, and the zoning administrator finds that I can't approve that permit. Uh, and you have to give a reason for it. And that person then can decide whether they disagree with the wording or uh, with the decision made and so forth. And they can appeal to the Board of Zoning Appeals to determine if that was properly made. Now, I think I indicated one one meeting that in some 39 years, I've been to three meetings like that. That's how few times that happens. But that's one thing they can do. The second thing are variances. Now, variances are numerical things. This would be if somebody had, say, a 15-foot say a side yard, and they wanted to move, they, they didn't have a garage or something, they could ask for a variance in the side yard setback to maybe to add a garage to the route, things like that. Sometimes you would, very few times, you have somebody want to raise the height of it and so forth. Sometimes it has to do with how much you have on the property. For example, uh, in the residential area, I've got is it 30 or 35 percent uh, of, of buildings on the property. And they can come in and request a numerical change to that, things like that. So uh, the number of parking spaces. Uh, um, I have uh, three zoning uh, and three variance cases coming up in December in the city uh, that relate to the number of apartments in the building. Anything that's a numerical number in the book can basically be uh, requested as a variance. And when they do that, they notify the neighbors that within 200 feet, 1,000 feet if they're on the edge of the city. But they make the final determination on those things. And the third thing is, and these are conditional uses, those exceptions. Now this is something that council has to be satisfied with. You can, and I would tell you this, if you didn't want them to have any control over them, you can take all of them back. 
In 39 years, we've had one city, and I don't know why it even happened, but uh, they decided that uh, they would handle all of the conditional uses. No other city in 39 years has ever done that. There are smaller things, it might be a child care center, it might be a small a used car lot, things like that, that would be conditional uses by the Board of Zoning Appeals. So those three things, they make a final determination. And also there's another advantage. You give 20 days notice, and they can meet, and uh, the next day they can come into the zoning administrator and get a permit. Whereas on um, these other things, you know, they have, they, when they come to you, they have to wait 14 days for the neighbors to be notified, uh, the neighbors to have an opportunity for protest petitions, and you have to publish the ordinance in the paper. So you gain probably 15, 17 days uh, by doing it on a small scale. Now that, in other words, you all make the if there's a zoning change. You're going to make 90, 95% of the decisions in zone. The smaller things, I don't think you're going to have any appeals in one in three years. And uh, you might occasionally have somebody have a side yard set back. So you're saying anytime there's a zoning change, that will have to come before okay. the council. For any special use. Now, one thing, right now, in the present zoning regulations, remember you all wanted to allow, and, and I want you to know, I learned something about it, and I appreciate the knowledge of it, about a better use for these um, vacant lots, these middle vacant lots that either have had houses on them before or they're still vacant and so forth, in between other development. Now, the present thing, we had no choice. Because your present book does not have special uses in it. And so we had to make it a, a conditional use as an exception. So right now, those lots, what do you what do you all call them? Vacant lots? Huh? Yeah, vacant lots. Some of them may have a garage on them and no house. So. Yeah, you, you remember. And, and that's in your present book. We added up to it. Only as the Board of Zoning Appeals makes the final determination. Now, by adopting these new ones, this becomes a special use. If they hold a hearing, and then it comes to the governing body to make a final decision. decision. Now, the reason I think it's much fairer, because you're making a pretty good commitment. I mean, neighbors are going to be a little bit concerned about this. And, and you can put conditions on it and so forth, as you did the one that you all had as a conditional use. Now, as a special use, you can put conditions on it. The neighbors can uh, sign a protest petition in the next 14 days after it, so they have a little more power to express themselves. And then it comes to you all. If the neighbors, and this doesn't happen very often, you might have one every three or four years, something like that. Uh, but uh, it would force the governing body to have a three-fourths vote if you wanted to prove that zone. It would take four of you to do it. So what I'm saying is that right now, the planning commission, sitting as the Board of Zoning Appeals, is making the decision for you on those vacant lots. If you adopt this, the governing body will make those decisions. <coughs> and give more input from the neighbors at the same time. Okay. Uh, you pretty much covered that. Uh, I do have another question here on 3-9, moving structures. It says, no structure shall be moved into the city, nor from one location to another location within the city, unless such structure shall, when relocated, be made to confirm fully with these regulations and other codes of the city, including the building codes, a lot of people buy these storage buildings and set them. Are we going to, is, does that statement right there not allow any of that? Or am I reading that wrong? Okay, let, let, let me look at it. It 
It just says that it has to be code. You can't it put says it. right off the bat, it says no structure right. shall be moved. Unless it meets the regulations. Right. It what can't be moved in and set a foot from the alley. It has to meet the setback regulations. Okay. <clears throat> That's what that means? Yeah. Okay. It just means that you have to put it. You can't like just stick you it wherever you, you want to put it. Be just like if you were building a new building, you need to, to okay. adjust to the well, right of ways and those things. This got written began to write it many, many years ago. And uh, somebody um, took a, um, a 1960 farmhouse and uh, wanted to move it in in the middle of a subdivision of houses that probably weren't 10 years old or something. And in addition to being a 1960 building, it was two stories high, and all the others were single-story buildings. And they said, wait a minute, there's, there's something wrong here. And so that's how that, many years ago, began to be written. And so the idea is to prevent something that would be just simply uh, not, not in keeping with uh, the area that it moves in now. It says, though, that if it's architecturally, uh, later on, we had somebody that moved in an older building. They added a garage, they painted, uh, they wanted to, so we're going to paint the whole building, we're going to put a uh, porch on it, things like that. They made it look, you know, they, they upgraded it. And so <coughs> it just simply said that you can't move in something that would be detrimental to the uh, value of the houses or next door, so to speak. It's a very valuable thing, and it comes up occasionally, not very often, but only if somebody moves in a huge structure, not a new one. See, a new one, you can, use, you can move in a modular home in this. You can move in, uh, uh, well, did he answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, back under 4-8, special uses. B, you've got lumber yards in there. We've only got one lumber yard here in town. Is he going to have to get a special use to conduct business where he's at? He's already there. He said, yeah. He's already there, so it's going to be great. Yeah. Okay, so anything that's here in this is he day and age is here. They, so the the present lumber yard would be grandfathered in. in. Yes. That means legal. This is for new stuff. Years, the present one is that. This would be, now I, I should tell you, if they wanted to uh, uh, expand that, uh, you have a provision in here, another provision. Uh, which allows you, someone that is a legal non-conforming use and wants to expand, they can come, in this case, to your Board of Zoning Appeals as a conditional use and expand on that property. Now, a lot of zoning ordinances don't even allow that. They say you're grandfathered in for what you are. This allows them to come to just say on a one-time basis. Allow somebody on a one-time basis to come in and expand a legal non-conforming use, which normally in zoning you don't normally do that, but you can. This also, in case somebody else wanted to build a lumber yard, not very likely downtown, but if they did, they would then come under this also. Okay. Well, I think that's about all I had. Well, go back over to 4 7, number 6, you're on 4 8. Mm -hmm. Read it. 4 7. Yeah, on page 4 7, number 6. Number six. Four, seven. Uh, it 
seems kind of dis discrimination. The establishments employing not more than five persons in the construction business, such as plumbing, heating, and air conditioning, and electrical work, but not woodworking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've heard your explanation, but it seems far fetched that okay. six six employees would cause a fire instead of five. Well, what about well, what? a building, a business with six employees, a plumbing business, on the square? What are you going to do with all their equipment? I think that's the big thing. You I looked at your place, you and you're in the perfect spot. The there were nine vehicles. Well, if you were over here by the Pizza Hut, yeah. you know, you don't take up all of it in no space. So I think that's where, <coughs> that's where we're looking. Right. But, so, you're, so you're not saying I can't go over here and put in an office to no. put Davis Plumbing, electrical mm -hmm. heating and air conditioning, and we all check our time cards in there and, I mean, and leave your vehicle sitting And have seven employees, and they all park in the street with their vehicles, and they get to pick up and leave. You're just thinking we can't have our equipment and parts and things. But it strictly says in commercial it has to be inside. There's no outside storage. I just... Could that not be... Could you not apply for a conditional use if you wanted to have more employees? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the way you've got it written. And that's... Well, what, yeah. what kind of interesting is where the whole idea came from in the first place. Let me just run through one, two, three, if I might. Um, first of all, most cities do not allow construction firms downtown, so it's in the downtown area. Um, most of them don't. Okay. Now, those that do, and I don't know what percent, but certainly we've got, I don't know, uh, those that do, they first might do it as a special use or a conditional use so that they could put some conditions like where like all their trucks have to be in the back or some, you know, it all depends. Yours puts it right up front as a permitted use and, and the only thing it does is limits the number in order so it isn't a huge operation that might need a lot of trucks or need a lot of outdoor uh, sales. Now, what's interesting, in your present zoning book, this is where the idea came from. Here it is, in the present, that's page 46 in your present book. And it's interesting, it's added at the end. So it's something you all did, you know, years ago after this. See, this, when this book was written, this had like 94 uses list for the downtown area. We've tried to group them so that you don't have to list all 94. And then it says, carpenter and cabinet shops employing five pieces of people or less. And it says, plumbing shops employing five pe people or more. And this is where this came from in the beginning. Now, there's no magic number, which whatever you say you want to have it. You don't even have to have a number. But it does ensure you that a company that ought to move out and, and have room for parking and, and inventory and outside activity. Now, as the gentleman was saying, if, if somehow it was a, a current construction company and they needed an outside, say, in the back to do something, uh, they can go to the Board of Zoning Appeals and allow, them, not, not on the present one, but on the new one, they would allow them to have some activity in the back. Uh, and uh, uh, there might be some screening from a neighbor or something like that. But at least they'd be allowed to do it if, if they want to do it. So there's more than there is in the present one. And does that, does that, um, is that any question you got? Oh, yeah. Now, I've already written there, you can get a variance or a special use permit. It just, it just seems odd that you would not include woodworking. Oh, well, the reason for that, and again, if you want to do it, you know, uh, my experience has been, okay, one of the reasons for not having, and, 
and this is not your problem at the moment, uh, but one of the reasons for not having construction type companies, most of them want to have a, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, a garage door opening, uh, what do you call it? Overhead, overhead door. door. An overhead door opening. Mm -hmm. And uh, for some reason, I've observed uh, that the mill work it takes a lot of lumber and a lot of going and coming and so forth. And uh, I can tell you, if you go to Bueller, you'll find that one half of a block, you can't park at all. So it uses up parking that would, see, you're not requiring off-street parking downtown. So you need that street parking. So it's no, no big deal. You know, put in millwork if you want to. But that's the reason they take up more overhead parking than other types of business. Anything else, Kevin? No. That's all I have. Bobby? <clears throat> yeah, on six, seven. Home occupation is prohibited. Permitted home occupation shall not in any event be deemed to include. I understand a lot of them and I don't have a problem with a lot of them. Uh, I do have, we do have some people here in town that does some work out of the garages. In fact, I think, Lawrence, where'd you start mechanicing at? In the backyard. In the backyard. Garland, where'd you start your, car, uh, your cement brick playing in 1962? Did you have a, a somewhere to do that, or did you kind of do that on a, out of your garage or something? Well, my work was just the fact he did it on the job itself. Yeah. But didn't you have so any tools or anything you had to keep anywhere? On the job? I, I don't know. But Probably in the pickup. I don't know. The only one that I've really got a, a concern about is the second one. Uh, and I understand what you're trying to do, but there's a lot of these people that do a little wrenching in their backyard or mechanic work or something of that nature. And I know that's where I started out. The only thing I would say about that is that you know, a guy working on some cars in his garage is not adding much to the economy of St. John. But it may be causing a loss of value to his neighbors. You know, a guy working on a vehicle with two or three vehicles sitting around could be causing some detriment to the neighborhood while he's not really adding a lot to the city. I mean, I understand it's a good place to get started, like Lawrence, to go on with business. But if you're in the middle of a block with some house, residential houses around you, it's just not a very good thing. You know, because once, once you start with one vehicle, then there's two or three, five or six, then there's transmissions, there's motors, there's there's radiators, there's this or that, like here and there, and next thing you know, they start piling up. And there's noise at night. Well, you know, that's kind of the unfortunate thing. I mean, it's too bad if there was some way to confine it to one vehicle or some, you know, something. But as you say, this is exactly what happens when you get successful. I've had uh, people uh, retire from uh, being mechanics and so forth, and you find them uh, in their cars in the garage, They're taking vents out. And uh, this can be, uh, you know, they're parking them on the street, you know, it, it just it gets out of hand. And uh, if it's something, you know, if, if it's something you felt it had to be allowed, put something in, but it's something that usually kind of gets out of hand. Also, they're competing with the regular companies that provide and, you know, and pay for a regular garage and so forth to do those things. So, 
done for them by fixing their own vehicle or working with their son or daughter to uh, fix up a, a car, you know, anything like that. So it doesn't prevent that. Yes. I'm hearing what you're saying, and I understand your concerns. The lady has a beautician shop in her house, and she's got five people over there. She's taking a look at much room and saying, guy trying to work in that shop. I know it's not the same, don't get me wrong, but if you're going to have home, home occupations, each one causes it, you know, they ain't going to do anything there if they don't have room and if people can't come there. Beauty shop, whatever. It's highly unlikely that one operator would have five cars at one time. And usually for a short period of time, yeah. where, right. you're, where you're not talking about the value of existing homes. Let's just make a mistake. Yeah. Bobby, I had a lady that I considered pretty wise. And she said to me, she said, you know, we're not going to have businesses lined up trying to come into St. John. We're not going to have people just running over each other to try to come here and buy a house and live here. But she said, why don't we try to protect what we have? And I think that's the whole feeling. With these conditional uses or whatever we have, something comes up that doesn't fit, it can be taken care of. This new zoning is much easier to work through a problem than the old one was. If you stay with the old one, with all respect now, but if he wanted to really be a horse's neck with the old one, he could really go. But with the new one, I, I think I think it turns people loose, even though it still controls. I would hope it can, would control some of the junk that's around town right now. Uh, this scares me about this uh, grandfather and deal when I drive down the street and there's an old car up on the front yard here, and there's one over here, and there's one over there. So I, I don't know where that's going, but those, those need to be gone. <clears throat> I, uh, you asked me about time. First time I saw St. John was 1959. And I grew up in a little old town that was, we had a paved road one way and a paved road the other way, and that was all, everything was dirt streets. I drove in here and I thought that is the neatest, cleanest town I have ever seen. For the time I wasn't planning on living here. But Dina's folks got up in years and she finally said, let's move up there. And I've never been sorry. I can see at, at one time, well, Jim Elliott, they used to run the street sweeper all the time. And I've heard for years, boy, that's expensive. It tears up the new parts, new this, new this. But at one time, I bet Jim had that street sweeper running twice a week, all day long. Mm -hmm. But it is, it's still a nice town, but we're, let, we're letting a lot of stuff accumulate that certainly doesn't help us. So I would hope with the new zone and everybody being fair about it, there may come a time, and I wonder about this, with conditional uses, it might come up that uh, whoever made the decision, they can say, yes, you can do that. Somebody down the street, three or four blocks away, said, well, I've got the same condition. Well, he doesn't have. So somewhere along the line, you know, there may be somebody saying, well, he can get by with it, but I can't. So there'll have to be some rulings, rulings done. I don't think it's infallible, but I sure think it's... Uh, oh, I think it's better than the old one. By far. By I've far. had a lot of trouble with the old one. I sold a lot of real estate, and I've had people come in and drives around the town and, oh, you've got such a nice town, it's so clean, and they always comment on how many new cars and pickups are around the school, and, well, it, it shows that we're in there, and I've just had, I've had nobody complain about 
being dirty down or anything like that. I've had a lot of compliments. I only have one other thing that a citizen brought to my attention, and it was under 7-3. The signs on the trees or utility poles, there's no private sign, shall be attached to a tree or utility pole, whether on public or private property. And this person, which is an older lady here in town, uh, been working in the bank forever, uh, she said, why don't you allow the signs to be there as long as you remove them? And I told her I would bring that to somebody's attention. I was one of the reasons the utility is maintenance. And how many signs are we going to talk about on the utility pole? The maintenance and uh, uh, whether it would do damage to the pole or anything like that. Now, now I don't know. Maybe somebody else knows, but. Uh, I'm Sure, there's any even maybe there may be even some state laws about uh, not putting things. The, the utility company owns that pole. I think there is because I know out on the main highway you can't attach anything to anything to the state has out on the sides. Right. The state you cannot right do it. I did it that. before, and I was. It oh. wasn't long, and the state was calling me. I mean, oh. they was not up very long. I got a campaign sign picked up and thrown away. Okay, if that's true, uh, why would uh, trees be, be in the well, same deal as the I suppose it's an environmental issue of damaging the trees and so forth. But you can imagine people you know, all over putting up signs on trees, which you know, look like. See, the problem that anybody has doing this, we think of you know one or two people doing something. We don't think of, and I, and I hope every time I get specific, I get into trouble. But uh, Avon dealers and so forth. I mean, it, it, it's for some reason the Avon dealers understood that you could put signs on trees. You see what I mean? You could have I don't know how many Avon dealers you got in town. Yeah. So it's things like that. I mean, it's not just one. It's if somebody sees one, they think they can do it and so forth. But it's also it's not good for the trees either, too. But I've had people put signs on our pole right on the corner. Like what? That like garage sale signs and stuff like that. You know, something simple. I mean, I don't have a problem with it, but are they going to go back and take it down? Right. No. And it's a fact. They don't. Now, the smart thing, I'll tell you if you want to do it, is you drive around in your pickup truck and you stand in the back and put them up because Mel can't reach up. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Billy. That's, that's another reason not to do it. Just, you know, that's what some companies will like telemarketers and things like that. You'll see them on a, on a Friday night going around getting up about 20 steps, maybe 12 feet high, trying to see. I think it'd be good, Madam uh, Mayor, to know there is an obligation on the part of the zoning administrator in this material to keep track of ideas and problems. And, and you have in here, now, I get kidded a lot about it, and I'll tell you why, but this says in here that uh, at least once a year, and it's in your bylaws. No, it's in here when you do it. I think it's January or February, some date, in some month in here. That you look at your zoning regulations and turn to your zoning administrator and ask have we had any problems and then anybody else that may be attending uh, to update. And uh, I learned uh, long ago uh, in adopting is it one of the first I ever did. Uh, and somebody came in and they said, you know, uh, it isn't, they were home builders, and they said, it isn't like we like to have any more regulations than we have to, but these are good and, 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 and it's okay. But what government doesn't do is keep them up to date. Now, I'm going to be critical for you. Yours is not, well, now you had maybe two or three updates, and, and since 1986, you see. And so this says annually you look at it. Now, that doesn't mean you change it every time, but uh, it needs to be tested out, just like an automobile or something. And 
see if there's any changes, uh, and Mel needs to keep a, an account or something. He's had a problem, so you ought to ask him at the end of the year. Yeah. And you, you have a public hearing, you do an ordinance, and you attach it to the back of it. And you do it. Yeah. Just like you did the, the, the additional use for the uh, uh, vacant lot. Okay, anything else? Do you have anything else? No? I don't think so. I hope that the council will pass these. Yes. Let us get started using them. Yes. Me too. You guys did a wonderful job and a lot of time. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, John and Mal. Two or three changes you made that need to be added to the ordinance for your next meeting for consideration. That's the way you make the change. Can you make sure that we have a consensus at the oh, council for this change on the garage size then? So consensus of the council? Yes. So do I need a motion on that, John? No, not a motion. Just need to make sure that everybody is okay, okay with that. the changes. I'll be good with it. Kevin? Okay. We really can't take action tonight, but if we have a consensus, that's what I'll have in the, the minutes. And then we can take action on the 15th when we said we would, when we tabled it. Okay. What about the employees, Kevin? Are you okay with the way it reads? Yeah, I went over it with them earlier. <clears throat> Just get a special use permit or variance and get forgiveness. I think it'll all work. <clears throat> You know it will because we can't do without a plumber and an electrician, so we <laughs> have to get down on our knees. Oh, don't tell him that, Carlin. We can't do without. <laughs> yeah. He already knows that. Yeah. <laughs>